half a mile on from Goose Corner are the rocks. It's a lovely looking place. A belt of trees and a sandbank come right down to the edge of the water. As its name implies, it's an extremely dangerous place to sail. Some of the most frightening navigational hazards to be found anywhere on the east coast lurk just beneath the surface. Sailors come here from miles around to test themselves and their boats here. There they are, fearsome boulders strewn dangerously along the foreshore. Some of them as big as seagulls. Scotsmen gaze upon these east coast hazards and quake. It is though one of the loveliest anchorages on the east coast. It's a well sheltered spot with excellent holding and a small beach where you can land a dinghy at any state of the tide. Mm. It's got waders on. It's a natural hard area. At one time they used to swim cattle across from the beach here to the other side of the river. They were heading for the markets in Ipswich and London. Swimming them across would save the drovers a whole day. Nowadays, the rocks attract a lot of sailors. Most come here just for a day to mess around on the beach. <laughs> It's a great place for a swim, and after three or four hot days, the water in the East Anglian estuaries gets almost balmy. Wonderful. Although the local swans can at times be a bit intimidating. The rocks and the sand are washed out of a gravelly outcrop, full of fossilised shark's teeth for those with the diligence to seek them out. But why is it just shark's teeth? All those massive creatures that once swam in these waters must have left bits of themselves all over the tropical seabeds of East Anglia. But not here. No bones, no fossilised poo, just no. shark's teeth. That old gob bloke must have had a wicked sense of humour for sticking just a shark's teeth in the sandbank. What was he thinking? But the countryside around the rocks is beautiful in late summer. There are reeds, blown thistle down, crops of wheat and barley, traditional parkland and tinder dry sandy soils. As we came back to the boat, the dinghy cruisers in the Wayfarer were just settling in for the night. There's something almost zen about dinghy cruising, the essence of minimalist sailing. The good thing about the rocks is that it attracts the right sort of sailors, people happy to hang from a hook and soak up the silence. Although a bloke in a 30 foot lozenge did fire up a generator so he could watch TV or his kids go on the PlayStation, I don't know. But one of the locals rowed over, tapped on the side of the boat and asked him if he'd be turning it off soon. He quit. What's for dinner? Brown sludge and sweet corn. <laughs> with fresh homegrown beans and courgettes. Bread. And bread. Um, beer. And lime pickle. <laughs> and lime pickle. As the sun went down, the late returners drift back to their moorings passing like silent ghosts through the gathering gloom. Lovely.
I know this is hypocritical of me, but every time I pass a sailing boat, I get a small frisson of pleasure from seeing it drifting silently by. I love the shape of the thing, the gentle tug of the wind in the sails, the compound curves of sailcloth and hull, and the smile of contentment on the face of the man at the helm. When I see a mobo coming with a bridge deck crowded with beer spilling testosterone and then see it come through the moorings with its wash shaking every boat it passes, well, just dislike yeah. I can't help it. Big boat and a lot of beer. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think I enjoyed that? No, didn't. Next up, though, is Waldringfield. right on the bend of the river. It has a pretty good beach, crowded with holiday makers on a summer weekend. Ashore it's an attractive place, completely devoted to leisure now. Mm, the smell of fried food in the afternoon. Mm. Quite a few modern houses. Hell of a view. Then the footpath goes along here, and look at that, absolutely in the vernacular, my arse, fancy dogs, fancy fountains, fancy car, and this is the boat he's got. <coughs> At one time Waldringfield was a coprolite town. Dinosaur dung was dug out of the pits in East Anglia and sent to Fison's at Ipswich where it was treated with sulfuric acid to release the phosphate. But the trade died out in the 1880s when better fertilisers came along, notably bird and bat guano from the Pacific. It's a shame when you and your family have spent years making money out of one type of crap only to find someone comes along with better crap. Those dinosaur dung grinders thought they had jobs forever. Then Waldringfield got a cement works. They used to dig mud from the saltings to use in the mix, hence the rectangular cuttings along the foreshore on the southern side of the town. Down by the quay, estuary mullet now glide gently through the silky mud. These long-lived fish, up to 15 years, are really hard to catch, which is why they swim more or less unmolested. They're bottom feeders, and they love a good sewage outfall. Their longevity and feeding habits mean that they're great accumulators of heavy metals, another reason for not bothering to catch them. Strangely enough, they only appear in the estuaries once water temperatures get above 10 degrees C. For a long time, no one knew where they went in winter, until a diver in Chichester Harbour reported great shoals of comatose mullet hibernating on the seabed. He said he could pick them up and lay them over on their sides and they didn't move at all. The real glory of Waldringfield is the sailing. It's probably the best estuary sailing club on the east coast and regularly produces world champion sailors. And looking from Google Earth you can see why. The bend in the river means that a wind shear of 15 or 20 degrees at tree height can create a 180 degree shift at water level. These guys learn to respond instantly to wind shifts. Then there's the island, with shallows and the back channel. It makes these people ultra sensitive to the vicissitudes of both tide and current. I did inquire about its name. Most of the locals just call it the island, although one person did call it Fass Isle. Get it? It does cover at high spring tides, so its existence is a bit sporadic, and it has no name. It is, in fact, innominate. So I decided that it should therefore be called Sporonominate Island. I called Trinity House to tell them the good news that the island now has a name. 
The woman on the switchboard said that it was a great suggestion and that as soon as I got off the phone, she'd be contacting her boss about me and my extraordinary ideas. She did warn me, though, that naming features is a slow and bureaucratic process. It might take a few years before the name appears on the official chart, but I'm pleased to have tidied up a few loose ends for them anyway. The club has a fleet of wooden dinghies, dragonflies, which date back to the 1940s. The builders here at one time used to give Uffa Fox a run for his money. The club has a unique way of maintaining the numbers. When they come across an old one, rotting in a garage or under a tarpaulin, the fleet members collectively buy the boat at a knockdown price and give it to a sailor on the understanding that he'll get plenty of help in the restoration. No pressure. Well done, lads. An excellent plan that clearly works well. The dinghies look marvellous. And there are two other great things about Waldringfield. This boat belongs to the local vicar. And most summer evenings, one of the locals celebrates the going down of the sun by playing the bagpipes. How could you possibly not like the place? Between Waldringfield and Woodbridge, the river opens out into a fine, wide expanse of water before tightening up again at Martlesham Creek. Like many other East Coast rivers and estuaries, the Deben has a troublesome reach. It's where the channel takes a massive dogleg. In the days of sailing barges, it was a right nuisance to get around it. But unlike lots of other places, the locals decided to do something about it, and a cut-off was dug through the mud. This one is called Loader's Cut, and it has a story. A local printer, Mr Loader, was sued for libel, and the jury ordered him to pay £100 to the individual whom he'd libelled. Local opinion was very strongly on the side of the printer, and a fund was set up to pay the fine. The £100 was raised by all the locals, but Mr Loader refused to accept it and insisted on paying the money himself out of his own pocket. This left the question of what to do with the £100. Mr Loader only accepted it on condition that he could use it for the good of the town and it was used to pay for the digging of the Loader's cut. So, an aid to navigation and some work for the unemployed. Not nice work, digging holes in mud, but there you go. Almost at the top of the Deben sits Woodbridge, and if you want a classic East Coast town, the sort of place where you can sit on the foreshore and dream about lovely boats, then this is the place to come. There's never a moment when someone isn't doing something on the water. Woodbridge also has a fine tidal pool. The mill is still in working order, although the pool's now a marina for the depth-challenged boats. The water is retained by a tidal sill, so they can only get in and out at high tide. It's a pleasant enough place to leave a boat. A bit pricey, though. Near the entrance, the mobos hang around the fuel dock like drunks clinging to a bar. But if, like me, you can take the mud, then you can stay for free at the town quay. And it's not often you get a deal like that today. 
When the tide goes out, you can watch the swans and the occasional seal enjoying the mud. There are some extraordinary liverboards to look at. The town is worth a few hours or more. A delightful place of narrow streets and quite expensive shops. But if you're considering buying a house here, best have some pretty deep pockets. A terrace will cost you £850,000. Woodbridge also has a good railway connection and a platform that overlooks not only the estuary but a truly fine establishment. The brokerage belonging to the legendary Andy Seed House. This was built here, 25 foot long, carvel pine on oak with a long keel. It's got a four year old diesel in it, that'd be brilliant. Got that, Americans, buy that. Come over here and buy a boat and ship it back. And his cavern is a real treat. When he buys a boat, he strips all the unnecessary bits and bobs you and I leave behind fenders, surplus warps, clocks, and puts them in his emporium and sells them off. It's a great way of making money. Andy Seedhouse, how long have you been in the business? About 32 years now. Have I you? Suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you start it? I did, yes. I realised there was a gap in the market all those years ago where you could buy a brand new yacht for a boat yard, but you couldn't buy a dinghy to go on the back of it, so uh, I plugged the gap. And the bottom price? Oh, 50 quid when I started. Nowadays, about 150. But, so you uh, could still come in here and buy a boat for 150 quid? You can, yeah. Yeah, you can go sunning down the river with the rest of them for about 150 quid. If you don't mind doing a bit of work yourself on the boat. But you do have the most amazing... I mean, is there an upper limit to the size of the boat you're uh, No, but physically we'd only get about 35 foot into our yard and the rest are sort of dotted around on brokerage. But uh, in the yard, yeah, up to about 35 foot of all sorts, cruisers, yachts, fishing boats. And there are not many kind of yards now that just sell boats. I mean, there are, there are marinas and, and there are brokerages and they don't, they don't have a yard. But I mean, you have a yard full of boats that you're we selling. We do something for everybody, we hope, yeah, at the right price. So, as I say, if our clients don't mind doing a bit of work, they come away with a bargain. And uh, motorboats as well or mostly sail uh, yachts? Mostly yachts, but fishing boats, cruises as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me, uh, you've been dealing with sailors for a long time. They're barking, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Only on the bad days, yeah. <laughs> But there is something deranged about us, isn't there, don't you um, think? It's, it's a strange hobby, but once you get into it, it takes some getting out of. And uh, if you're going to be addicted to something, make it yachting, I think, rather than anything else. So, so how many boats have you got in your yard at the moment? Uh, You've got a guess now, haven't you? Yeah, I have. About 70. Have you? <laughs> a few gaps for a change. Yeah, we had a very busy year. So uh, people staying at home and buying boats again, I'm pleased to say, rather than going abroad. The, the, the other thing around here is there are lots of, the, there are lots of clinker-built boats around here, aren't there? there lots are. of clinker-built wooden boats, big boats. Why? Why, why the clinker-built around here? Uh, people love them. Traditional, been in the area for years, and a lot of them were built locally. And Where were they built, do you know? Oh, local boat yards around here, yeah, yeah. Uh, Catchpool 22s, that sort of thing, people still love them. Um, all manner of types, really. Is that your phone? Do you want to get it? it is my get phone. it. No, 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 business, uh, do do it. I don't stay, carry on. Just along the quay is Everson's Boatyard, with its wonderful clinker-built shack, and its proprietor, Jeff Sinton. He's one of those lovely blokes you come across who's involved in the boat business because he loves boats rather than business. And his shed is, well, just perfect. Put preservative on it or anything? Um, we have done once, yes. That's good enough, is it? Lifetime's worth of... Lifetime guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> It's a temporary structure, put up, we believe, about uh, 100 years ago. And it's uh, only standing because uh, the wind whistles through it rather than blowing it over. But it's, it's clinker. It's, it's a clinker-built clinker shed. Clinker-built shed, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it's a proper traditional uh, Suffolk shed, all clinker. Um, what do you call it locally? Suffolk, what do you call it? Laps? No. Uh, shiplap. Shiplap, yeah, is it? Yeah. That's the, but, oh, I see, uh, really? Yeah. Shiplap? Oh, yeah. That's the word for this, That's doing it this way. Well, but, yeah, I would call it clinker though. Yeah, clinker yeah. building, that's near enough. Yeah, and are there bits of boat in here? There's plenty of bits of boat. I mean, in the fabric oh, of the yeah, shed though? All, it's all built out of bits and pieces. Is it? Can yeah. you show me some bits of... Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anything we could scrounge, you know. I mean, there's, 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 there's mast, that's probably a bit of mast or boom in there. Um, all these probably. Presumably, it's not the warmest shed in the world though, is it, in the winter time? In the winter it's not, in the summer it's... Fine. Warm. Yeah, that's a, yeah, absolutely great. Yeah. So if it's warm outside, it's the same temperature inside. It is. It's, it, it's too hot in the summer. It's too cold in the winter. 
Um, and the other problem is that uh, people's boats have got bigger, and so really it's just not... It's not big enough. Not big enough in terms of height. So does uh, this mean you haven't really got planning permission for it to be here? It was just... It's a temporary structure you don't need. <laughs> it's, it's been here for, since 1912. <laughs> so there's bits of, bits of boat in here. Um, wow, this is a nice shape. What is it? I have no idea. You don't know? Well, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a sad one, actually. Um, it was... We, we bought this hull on spec to fit out um, as and when. Yeah. And that was three years ago, and we haven't had any spare time since then. Well, that's good, though, isn't it? It's come from, it, it was, it, the hull was moulded at St. Osef. And this is a National 12? It's a National 12. And a mirror? Also with a chequered history. Why has that got a chequered history? Uh, it was built... Uh, and between it being started and finished, the, uh, the, the class changed the rules. Oh, this is nice too. This is our latest baby. You, are you making these? Yeah. Well, that is nice. Yeah. Well, I could what is that? Is that 12 foot long or something, is it? She's 9 foot, 9 foot 3, and... Uh, and just a single... Is this a, is this a gaff or a gunter, is it? Gunter. Gunter rig. Gunter rig. Is this, I've seen a bloke sailing a, a wooden boat that looks very similar to that, sailing it out here, about yeah. the same size. Yeah. Is it the same boat? Not quite. Because I shouted at him and he wouldn't talk. Uh, is he deaf? He's slightly deaf. Is he? Yeah, because I shouted at him. He's a lovely guy. Is he? Really nice to be in a little nine foot dinghy again, just creeping along the creeks. Beautiful. It's early in the morning, it's about quarter past seven. So I'm just going for a sail. Just, uh, just so deliciously simple rope for a horse, and an uphaul, and a downhaul, and a kicker. It's great. He's put um, one extra bit of freeboard on. I think the original dinghy would have stopped here. He's put this little bit extra in because he knows that what its, its real future is as a tender. It's bound to be laden with a lot more than just one large man. You're going to wind up with a large man, a dog, a load of gear. So, you know, from a dinghy, what you want is a good deal of freeboard. Doesn't seem to compromise its sailing abilities at all. Now we're coming onto a reach and she's just chuckling along beautifully. The, the boat sails really, really nicely, but this little dinghy is £3,000. Yeah, it's not an expensive price given the labour and the cost of labour and all the other things that have gone into it, but £3,000 for a little dinghy like this. Who has money to spend on such things? The Deben more or less ends at Woodbridge, although above the tidal pool there are some lovely boatyards with the usual collection of cranes. And at one boatyard, a bloke doing some dredging while listening to Radio 2. As I said, never a dull moment at Woodbridge. Just before the road bridge that marks the end of the navigation, there's a massive area of land that has been allowed to go back to being estuary. It's amazing how quickly nature re-establishes itself once we stop fighting it. The tide is nibbling away at the old sea walls and slowly turning them to mush. It's rather nice to see.